Ladies and gentlemen, will you take your seats, please? Thank you very much indeed. My name is Fiona Godley. I'm editor-in-chief of the BMJ, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you here. I should begin by saying we already have a winner. Is there a Kasim Rafiq in the audience? Kasim Rafiq? I have his wallet here. <laughs> He's not here. He's obviously looking for it. If you know Kasim, we have his wallet. <laughs> so, uh, sadly, there is no such thing as a miracle diet. But there is such a thing as a miracle meeting. And in my view, this is it. So before I get into why we're here, uh, I'd like to begin with some thanks. First of all, thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, there wouldn't be a meeting without you. And thank you to all of those who are watching, listening online. This is being live streamed, and we hope reaching a very wide international audience. I think we've got a pretty eclectic mix of people here. We've got clinicians, public health experts, researchers, science journalists, journal editors, and a range of other people who um, will tell me afterwards that I've missed them out. But we're very, very grateful to you all for being here. A big thanks to the authors who have agreed to come together for, from often disparate viewpoints and have delivered their articles amazingly on time under a huge amount of pressure. And the articles are available in this uh, supplement, print supplement for this meeting, but also av available online. Um, at, and we hope you will go there and read them and comment on them on bmj.com. A huge thank you to our series advisors. We have been incredibly well served by Darius Motsferian and Nita Faruhi, both of whom are also authors and they'll be speaking. So you'll be able to uh, see them then. But we've had an amazing um, support and help from them throughout this process. A big thank you to the BMJ team. Navjoit Lada and Dar uh, Duncan Jarvis are here. Paul Simpson, Jackie Annis, Will Style Timmons, and David Allen are not. But it's been a very much a team effort to get to where we are with this. Uh, a, an equally big thank you to the Swiss Ray Institute team. Uh, and just to mention Andre, Jennifer, Whitney, and Annabelle, uh, I think you can see the amazing job they've done in bringing this meeting together. Uh, and thank you specifically to Jeff Bonn, who you're going to meet in a minute, and also to Dr. John Shunby, uh, who has shown enormous courage and um, a fantastic sense of collaboration. From us, from the BMJ point of view, deciding who to collaborate with is a very difficult process, and we were immediately struck by the shared purpose that we held with Swiss Re. Uh, we all want longer and healthier lives for ourselves and our families and our populations, and Swiss Re is, is, is dedicated to that um, end, as is the BMJ, as well as a commitment to um, being evidence-based and providing a forum for debate rather than necessarily taking an individual line on something. So what's the aim of the meeting and of the series of articles? Well, it seemed to me and my colleagues that there were few areas of health that were more important than nutrition, few that were more fraught with controversy, conflict of interest and confusion, and few that were more neglected in medical education. So the BMJ is an academic journal, but it's one that is also widely read by clinicians around the world. And we were aware of discussions happening in specialist journals and conferences and in books and articles by science journalists, but very little good coverage of these discussions amongst doctors and in the general medical and healthcare arena. Uh, you might say this is not unusual. Science moves in, at one speed, its own speed, and clinical medicine and public health move at another. And this, in some cases, may be a good thing. It can take time for the science to mature and for consensus to be reached. But in the case of food, it is so huge in people's lives and in society that what we have seen is the simplification of complex messages and then the magnification of those messages to such an extent that the science tends to be obscured and at times manipulated in ways that don't serve patients or the public. And this concern has to be set, I think, in the context of another of the BMJ's areas of concern, which is medicalization. The huge rise in the past 30 years or so of the culture of a pill for every ill and then an ill for every pill. <laughs> so one of the problems of overdiagnosis and the rise of the pre-disease idea, so pre-diabetes, pre-osteoporosis, pre-dementia, um, pre-hypertension. One of the concerns about that in our current paradigm is that it pushes people to become patients. It pushes people into medication. If, on the other hand, the science can support, instead of medication, lifestyle change, 
with broad benefits for health and society. That has a huge potential to change things for the better and shift the need for early detection and early understanding of people's risk factors into a very much more positive frame. So, our hopes for this series of articles and for this meeting is to bring together people of disparate views and disciplines, to take a cool, hard look at the science, to see if we can find common ground on what we know and what we don't know, what is controversy and what is misinformation, and to help to speed up that process of translation into policy and practice. So four specific hopes, my personal hopes, that we have a reasonable debate, a meeting of minds, that we can end up, as a result, eventually with guidelines that do a better job of independently summarising the totality of the evidence base. I'd like to see clinicians and policymakers more confident in guiding patients and the public in an evidence-based fashion. And I'd like to see an agenda for future research that really takes us forward in ways that we need to advance. Now, there are gaps. I wouldn't want to claim this is a comprehensive meeting or a comprehensive series of articles. Uh, there are gaps in the article's coverage. There are gaps in the authorships. There are gaps in the attendance at this meeting. I think I'd like to just point out that we have not achieved a good representation from low- and middle-income countries. I think that's obvious just from looking around the room. But also, inevitably, um, well, not inevitably, but I think that's fair to say also in the series, that's a gap we hope to address. Uh, we also have not necessarily reflected all of the clinical disciplines. We've been criticised, rightly so, perhaps that we haven't got nutritional therapists widely represented in this audience, and we could have perhaps done better in, in encouraging them to attend. Uh, and then there are conditions uh, and interventions that aren't covered yet, but we hope that that will um, happen in the future. So important to stress this is not the end. This is the beginning of a conversation. This is not a commission. This is not saying this is what needs to happen. This is a debate. Uh, and I think that there are conversations at this meeting that will fuel other articles and other meetings, more, more um, space and forums for discussion. And one in particular I just want to mention that we are launching today is BMJ Nutrition and Preventive, sorry, BMJ Nutrition Prevention and Health, which is a new open access online journal. And I'm delighted that we have um, the editor of the journal, Martin Kohlmeyer here, professor at the University of North Carolina, and also James Bradfield um, of partners in the journal NNED Pro, Global Centre for Nutrition and Health. So we're really delighted to be launching that journal. We hope that it will become a forum for your work and the work of others in this area. Uh, how do we frame this meeting briefly to finish? Uh, how do we want to conduct these two days? Uh, we want to reflect the fact that this place is called the Centre for Dialogue. That's what we're aiming for, dialogue rather than argument, we want fruitful debate based on the science rather than ideology or personal belief. The science itself is vexed and problematic, that's absolutely clear, um, as it is in healthcare as a whole. So we shouldn't be afraid of this and we must work with what we've got. Uh, the science is open to different interpretations and that too is okay. And things are moving fast. Arguably, we are at a tipping point on a number of key issues in nutrition. So our aim here is not for everyone to agree, far from it, but it is for us all to engage in a mutually respectful conversation that draws as far as possible on the available evidence. I mentioned the importance of vested interests and conflict of interest, and these are not only financial conflicts of interest, but also academic and personal. So we're asking that speakers and panellists declare their conflicts of interest as fully as possible. Uh, and one unusual feature of this meeting is going to be how tightly we scrutinise each other's dietary choices through the next two days. Uh, and Swiss Re have um, helped in this to some regard and also declared their own views very um, subtly in providing full fat cream at all the coffee stations. So uh, you can take from that what you will. <laughs> I do understand also from John Shumby there was a debate about whether to provide a Mediterranean or a Nordic menu for supper tonight and you'll have to tell me which you think he chose. Um, and Building on that, I wondered whether in the spirit of um, openness and sharing, uh, you might also want to declare your own current dietary preferences when you're speaking. Um, I would declare mine, but I'm so confused that I don't know where to start, <laughs> but I'm happy to. Um, we want this to be an interactive meeting uh, in this room and around the world. We have a live stream, as I've said. We have a Twitter feed, hashtag food for thought, number 418. Um, and we have not one, but three film crews uh, who are going to be taking slices of this and hopefully, sh well, definitely sharing it around the world. So, uh, and the discussion, I hope, will be animated, respectful and forward-looking. So I look forward to that very much.